CBS4 takes a virtual field trip on Grasslands Live. Thanks to our sponsors, including our presenting sponsor, Whiting Petroleum, committed to creating strong communities and a clean environment. Welcome to Grasslands Live, a distance learning adventure. My name is Dave Aguilera, and I'll be your host for today's program. This program is being brought to you by CBS4 Denver, the U.S. Forest Service, and many other partners. We are here today live at the Pawnee National Grassland in Colorado to learn about grasslands. Over the next hour, we'll be exploring this amazing landscape and learning about what makes grasslands so special. We've got viewers from all over the United States, and we want to hear from you. So during the program, we'll be checking our email, so please send your questions and comments in. You can do that on the webcast page where there is a simple form you could submit, or you can send your questions via email to comments and questions on the webcast page by email to fieldtrips at pwnet.org. I want to introduce you now to the experts who will be answering your questions here. So we go over to our expert table over here. First, we start with Kristen Philbrook, and she is with the Forest Service. Hi, Kristen. How you doing? Hi, everyone. Next in line here is Angela Dwyer with the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. Hi, Angela. Hi. And last but not least, Mike Stahl with, a, uh, with uh, Whiting Petroleum. He's a petroleum engineer and conservationist. Hi, Mike. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Thank you guys for joining us. And also, Dr. Bryce Hanbury and Brian Dickerson with the Forest and Grassland Research Laboratory in South Dakota are standing by to respond online as well. So be sure to send your questions. Let's take a look at the map now and see exactly where we are today. You can see the Pawnee National Grassland is located in northern Colorado in Weld County near the border with Wyoming. It's near a major urban area like Denver, also Greeley, Fort Collins, and Laramie as well. Now I have a special guest for us today. I'd like to introduce you to Rick Truex who is with uh, the uh, Rocky Mountain region for the U.S. Forest Service. He's a regional wildlife program leader. Rick, good morning. Good morning, Dave. Come on in here. Thank all you right. for uh, joining us today. Uh, he's here to tell us all about the national grasslands, including the Pawnee, where we are today, right? Very good. Well, welcome, everyone. I want to, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Pawnee National Grassland. As Dave said, I work for the U.S. Forest Service, and we are responsible for managing all national forests and national grasslands across the country. A lot of people know about the national forests, but not as many know about the grasslands. And what we, in addition to the national forests, we manage 20 national grasslands and one tall grass prairie preserve that total about 4 million acres. 4 million acres? Yep, 4 million acres of grasslands. That's huge. Huge. Now behind us, everybody's looking at the Pawnee Buttes here. Can we talk a little bit about those magnificent uh, land structures we yeah. have out there? So if you can imagine being here 100 million years ago, this would have all been underwater. At that time, there was a huge inland sea throughout a lot of the interior part of North America. Mm -hmm. As the Earth's crust shifted and the sea drained, it, it left behind sediments, which hardened into siltstone and sandstone. And then through years and years of erosion, it leaves behind these harder structures like the buttes and some of the other structures out here. So it's a great example of a long time process that leaves these remarkable features on the landscape. So all of that is just sea deposits that have built up yep. over millions and millions of years. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Thanks, Rick. Rick, of course, is going to stick around. Can you stick around? You bet. Okay, good deal. Rick is going to stick around. We'll be checking back with him again to learn some more about the grasslands. So we want to uh, stick around for that. Now I'd like to introduce you to some of our local students here today from Dos Rios Elementary School in Evans, Colorado. Come on in. Britton is first here in line. Britton Robbins, she's going to tell us exactly uh, what we're going to learn with the program. Uh, so why don't you, uh, you guys take it away here. Oh, we need the stick mic, don't we? Sorry about that. Here we go. Britton, and you are in what grade? Fifth. Fifth grade at Dos Rios Elementary. So tell us what, about what you guys are going to learn today. We are going to be learning about what a grassland is and the importance of grasslands to people, the importance of grasslands to animals, especially migrating birds the problems facing the grasslands, and lastly, what we can do to help. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much. And I know you've got all of your friends back here that came with you. How was the bus ride up here today? Long. Long. It was <laughs> long. Well, thank you. Now, what they're going to also be doing is becoming citizen scientists by doing citizen science activities during our program, and they'll be reporting back 
throughout the afternoon. All right. Thank you, Britton. We're going to bring Allison now in here. Hi, Allison. Hi, Good morning. Dave. Good morning. This is Allison Fowles. She's with the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. Allison, uh, why don't we tell everybody who's watching today just what it is uh, to be a citizen scientist and uh, what you have planned for today? Yeah. So citizen science is just another way to say that people of any age and from anywhere can contribute to science by sharing their knowledge and their observations of what's around them. Today, we're going to be using our binoculars, our ears, and our field guides to find as many birds as we can, and we'll be counting the variety of species that we see as well as the number of individuals. Later, we're going to share those observations online with a citizen science project called eBird. And eBird is really cool because when a lot of people all across the world share their observations with eBird, scientists can see when birds are migrating and if the populations are increasing, decreasing, or staying the same over time. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> good deal. So we've got a lot to learn from all of our students here. Can you guys say good morning real quick back there? <laughs> Good morning. Good deal. Good deal. We'll look forward to checking in with everybody at the end of the program to find out uh, exactly what they've seen. So thank you yeah, very thank much. You. Thanks for being here this morning. There are there's just tons of opportunities to participate in citizen science activities, no matter where you live, whether it's in a rural area or in the middle of the city, you can contribute to science. Check out the Grasslands Live website for more information about all of these projects. A lot of information there. So we are here at the Pawnee National Grassland. This wide open space is huge. There's a lot of space out here. But what exactly is a grassland? As you look out on this landscape, it looks very, very bare, except for the cattle grazing behind us. But it does look very bare. So as we find out what's happening out here, we want to learn exactly what's going on. And there's a whole lot going on out here. Grasslands can be found around the world and often are known by other names such as the North American prairies, South American pampas, Asian steppes, and African savanna. Historically, the short grass, mixed grass, and tall grass prairies covered about one-fifth of North America. To early European settlers, the grasslands seemed endless and teemed with life. Vast herds of bison thundered over the land, along with elk and other wildlife sustaining the lives of indigenous people for thousands of years. The United States acquired most of the Great Plains from France with the Louisiana Purchase of 1803. Until the late 1860s, the Great Plains region was viewed by Americans as their last frontier. The Homestead Act of 1862 enticed almost six million settlers by 1890 and encourage them to replace grass with crops. The difficulty of plowing through the dense root systems of the sod grasses, the extremes of weather and frequent drought tested the limits of those who would subdue the plains. The settlers soon discovered that while these vast grasslands were productive in wet years, they were also subject to periods of drought that devastated crops. By the early 1930s, the broad midsection of America was in trouble. The historic drought and winds known as the Great Dust Bowl made much of the land useless. In April 1935, dust clouds of epic proportions rose over 20,000 feet in parts of Oklahoma, Texas, Nebraska, Kansas, and Colorado. Land that should never have been plowed yielded its topsoil to incessant dry winds. Ten-foot drifts of fine soil particles piled up like snow in a blizzard, burying fences and closing roads. This led to the laws that implemented farming practices that saved the remaining soil and what was left of the grasslands. The predominant vegetation of grasslands is, of course, grass, tall, medium, and short. But the ecosystem includes much more. In addition to grass, a variety of plants, wildflowers, shrubs, and a limited variety of trees grow on grasslands, providing for humans, as well as mammals, birds, and many reptiles, amphibians, insects, and even fish. Water is an important resource throughout grasslands habitats. Small, isolated wetlands dot the dry grasslands and prairies, providing much needed water and supporting a diversity of plants and wildlife, including resident and migratory birds. These wetlands are called either playas or prairie potholes. Playas are shallow, temporary ponds that collect runoff from the surrounding area after heavy rains. Some dry up within days and others contain water for weeks or months. These water sources are also important because they recharge aquifers and improve the quality of that water. Today, much of the historic range of grasslands has been developed for homes, converted to agriculture, and or used for mineral and oil extraction. 
Many acres of grasslands have been altered to produce food, including beef, wheat, beets, and corn. However, remnant areas of this national treasure still exist and are managed by government agencies and private landowners. You can visit these special places and enjoy the vistas and a variety of wildlife and plants. You will be taken back in time and feel the wonder of the grasslands that was and still is an important part of America's landscape and heritage. We can all appreciate and do our part to protect this natural wonder. So grasses are the defining feature on the grasslands. Rick Truax is back uh, from the Forest Service and he's going to tell us a little bit more about all of the grasses that we have out here on the grasslands, right? right. So as you saw in the video, there are three general types of grasslands. We have short grass prairie, mixed grass prairie, and tall grass prairie. And really what determines whether you're in a short grass, mixed grass, or tall grass is the amount of rainfall the area reads, the amount of precipitation. And here in the Pawnee, we're in a short grass prairie system, mostly. And that's where we have about 15 inches of rain a year, and that kind of drives us into this short grass prairie system. But because there's so little rainfall in general here, these plants are pretty drought tolerant. So, and drought has been something we've been dealing with for the last several years out here, right? Yeah, it has, and you can see what it looks like today, and we get rain, we had rain yesterday, and you know, we'll talk a bit more about drought later in the program. And what I want to talk about, too, is just this reality that there's such a delicate balance between the amount of water and how these systems behave. Uh, if you look at our temperate rain, uh, grasslands, they receive typically between 10 inches and 30 inches of rain per year, or mm -hmm. precipitation per year. If you get much more than that, you'd start becoming a forest over time. If you get oh. much less, you'd start becoming a, a desert. So oh. we're right in that sweet spot where we have these grasslands. And it's, that makes the water that much more important, not just to plants, but to the wildlife that depend on them and to us as people as well. Mm -hmm. and, and plants and wildlife, and, and what, I, what I found out inter was interesting when I came out here, that there's actually fish out in the grasslands. Oh, you bet. We've got a lot of, we've got some streams and a lot of wetlands that are hot spots for biodiversity out here. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Now, as we look at, at the land surrounding us, we want to figure out what type of grass that we see. And we have some examples here, don't we? Yeah, we do. So here we've got uh, blue grama. And this is a grass that's pretty common in the grasslands, but this also will occur up in the foothills area, up in the Ponderosa pine forest up there. Oh, okay. And then on this side, we've got buffalo grass. And this is really a true grassland grass. And as you might guess from the name buffalo grass, this is an important food source for bison. We don't have bison out here on the prairie, on the Pawnee National Grassland, but we do have cattle, and the uh -huh. cattle will graze this as well. So it's a really important forage resource for the cattle that we permit to graze on the landscape. And I want to just tell you another interesting thing about this. It forms a very dense root mat, and it, it kind of leaps and then forms sod, essentially. So the oh. early European settlers, when they were coming out, they would cut blocks of sod out of the ground uh -huh. and build houses for shelter. So, and it also is uh, important if you get like heavy rains out here for uh, stopping. Yeah, it, it helps absorb the water as it comes out. Yep, it's got a very fine root mat that helps absorb the water that does come. Beautiful. Rick, a real lesson in water and grass. Thank you so much. Right. We appreciate that. Let's check in now with our experts. Hopefully you guys are sending in questions. We really want you to do that. I also want to remind you, our, uh, our audience today, that this program is live here at the Pawnee National Grassland in Colorado. Our experts will be answering your questions and responding to your comments, so please send them in to the email address that you see on your screen. So let's head over to the expert desk, and hopefully uh, your laptops are on fire and you're getting those questions in. Kristen, why don't we start out with you? Great. I have a question from Mr. Sremick's class in Florida, and that is, are animals and plants prepared for droughts on the grassland? And yes, they are. They have adapted to changes um, with having not much water. They often dig burrows in the ground to uh, stay cool, like swift flax, and the plants have really long roots to obtain moisture deep in the soil. Beautiful, good question there. Angela, how about you? Do you have one? Yeah, Nathan asks, how has fauna migration over the grasslands affected the livelihood of plants? Well, um, large un ungulates, for example, deer, antelope, bison, roamed uh, the prairie for thousands of years, and their movements ha actually helped to populate the grasses to act as pollinators by eating the seeds and spreading the seeds. Um, and today, cattle or sheep grazing actually mimic those conditions and help keep grasslands healthy. So great question. Good question. We're going to move on to another segment, Mike. So you will start our next segment when we okay. come over to the Thank expert you, desk. All right. Great questions. Thank you guys. Keep them coming. Uh, continue to send them in. Our experts are going to stay here for the entire hour. Looking forward to respond to anything you send in.
All righty, now that we know what grasslands are and some of the history of grasslands, let's talk about how grasslands are important to people and wildlife of all kinds. With me is Susan Johnson. She works uh, for the U.S. Forest Service in Tribal Relations. Susan, thank you for coming out today. Appreciate you being here. It's great to be here. Thank you so much. I love for... your necklace, by the way. Thank you so much. Very, very it's a nice. beautiful necklace that mm -hmm. I'm wearing today. Good deal. Uh, let's start right off the bat. I understand that you are Native American. I am Native mm -hmm. American. I belong to two tribes. On my mother's side, I'm a Rikara Hiradzan Mandan from North Dakota. And on my father's side, I am White Earth Chippewa from Minnesota. Um, there are about 566 federally recognized tribes that live in the United States, including um, Alaska, each with our own language, governance, and way of life. Now let's go back uh, in time. How many tribes used to reside on the grasslands? Many tribes used to live on the grasslands uh -huh. over time immemorial. By the 1800s, there were approximately 32 tribes living and hunting, sustaining themselves on the grasslands. Uh, because of the tribes in the grasslands were semi-nomadic, they would move uh, to where there was hunting. But there were several tribes, including my own, that made permanent habitats next to rivers, and we actually grew corn, squash, peas, and we uh, would uh, hunt, and we would hunt for bison and for deer. And so we had a very beautiful life. Um, several of the tribes did use teepees because it's a very convenient form of uh, creating mm -hmm. habitat. So that's part of the culture. The, part the, of the culture. The environment kind of drove the culture a little yes, bit, right? Yes, it did. Mm -hmm. Very good. The environment was really what we used to inform ourselves around our language, our arts, um, our way of life, and our ceremonies. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of intertwined. Let's talk a little bit about uh, with the environment and the culture together about the, the camping and the, uh, the dance that arose and that mm -hmm. type of thing. It's just, it's, it's all part of the big culture of living on the grasslands, right? So yes, go with me now. Let's say that we are a Native American family and we are, have our extended family, our grandpas and our grandmas and our cousins, and we are moving to a traditional hunting grounds and we're taking our habitat with us, which is in the form of teepees. Teepees are erected very quickly. They're great habitats and you put um, hide around them. When the people who were responsible for finding our camping sites found one, they would say, this is the place that we're going to be, and they would come and tap down the grass in a circle. While they were doing that, they would pray and sing a song so that while the people were there, while the families were there, that they would be protected and that the hunting would be good for the us. The grass dance, right? The, grass, the grass dance. dance? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Good job. Now let's move up to present day. Um, how are Native Americans in the grasslands uh, intertwined today? Well, there are approximately, and I'm, I'm being very um, general here, mm -hmm. about 39 federally recognized tribes who are affiliated and or still live very closely to the Great Plains grasses and also the Southern Plains. Um, as a little girl, though, our people are still very much utilitarians of our natural environment. And one of the particular plants that we are very fond of is a tall, beautiful, handsome pink flower called echinacea. Echinacea provides oh, yeah. medicine for us, and we use it when we're having a sore throat or a headache. Um, That's a popular plant to use right, these days, right? People can find it can in the grocery it. store, even you make right a, now. You make tea out of it? You make tea out of it. You can make a tincture out of it, and it's used for pain medicine. Oh, my gosh. Let's talk a little bit about how animals uh, are used and, and how, uh, how really our uh, animals are there for survival, basically, right? That's correct. One of the very important, and we just heard a little bit about it, was the American bison, bison buffalo. Mm -hmm. Um, at least here in the Great Plains, the Indian people revere the bison because it provided food, shelter, um, and a way of life for our people to be successful on the grasslands. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, we have a great deal of reverence for it, even today. It informed our culture, it informed our songs, our prayers, our governance, and our way of life. And we still are very closely affiliated to the bison as a very important animal to us today. And we were talking earlier that uh, there's a, a possibility, or has it already been done, that the bison is going to 
become the uh, the national mammal. Was you're that right. You're right? absolutely right. The bison was designated as the national ma mammal, very much like the bald eagle is the national bird. Wonderful. But what you may not know is that the bison is bring, being bring, brought back to Indian country, to tribal reservations, to be cared for and to be protected. Susan, thank you so much for uh, letting us know about all this. There's so much we can learn from traditional practices. Grasslands and people have a rich history together, and that relationship continues to be important today. In fact, today, ranching is an important part, an important economic activity that happens every day on the grasslands. I recently had a chance to talk with Katie Merriweather, whose family has been in Colorado for several generations, and she shared what it's like to ranch in this area. So, Katie, first let's, let's just start off with how you got involved in ranching. Well, it's been in my family for three generations now. My great-grandparents lived on the same ranch that my parents now operate and run and uh, they homesteaded it over a hundred years ago and we've been there ever since. How vibrant is the ranching community in Colorado these days? Well, it's an integral part of Colorado. Farming and ranching have been some of the largest staples of our economy for a long time. Uh, not just cattle, but uh, pigs, wheat, corn, uh, sunflower seeds now. It's a big part and it's uh, always growing and changing. Now, your ranch is in a, in a town called Carvel in Colorado, and it's something interesting has been happening there in regards to the mountain plover. Yeah, it's a fairly rare bird um, that thrives on areas with open ground, so grazed pastures are ideal places for them to live. They've been harder to spot over the years because they're a lot on private land, but what we've done is we've started a plover festival where people can come in and see this rare bird and live with local ranch owners for a weekend and, and spot this bird that's a prize for birders. We've been working to do grazing on rotation. Um, some of the local farmers will mark plover nests so that they don't run them over, so they can save them. In general, it's protecting areas which are especially vulnerable, so riparian areas, we can fence those off so that they continue to be healthy and a long-term resource. It really sort of opened my eyes to the land as a, as a whole, as how it works as a unit. Um, so you don't just have cattle, you don't just have chickens, you have coyotes, you have prairie dogs, which are the bane of your existence, but they're also the basis of this incredible ecosystem that mm. supports burrowing owls, that supports mountain plovers, that supports peregrine falcons, hawks, and it all works together. And so I became really interested in not just wildlife, but birds specifically, too. Really, in order for ranching to survive, you have to make sure that um, the grasslands survive, right? They kind of go yes. hand in hand. They do, absolutely. And a healthy grassland leads to a healthy ranch and vice versa. If you have a, a good, sustainable ranch, it's a healthy grassland. Sustainable ranching practices help not only cattle, but also wildlife. But the grasslands are home to more industry than you may realize. Our presenting sponsor, Whiting Petroleum, shares its vision for being a productive and caring member of this community. I like living out here because of the open space. You got fresh air, you can hear the birds singing, you have the wildlife. You know, the place has been in the family for over 100 years now and uh, still doing quite well. This is classified as semi-arid desert, and it is. Most people don't care for it out here. You know, the people that are from here love it. Well, I lived right here for, oh gosh, almost 40 years. We farm and ranch, raise wheat, corn, millet, sunflowers, cattle. It's all I ever wanted to do. <laughs> Grasslands, you see cattle. It's something that ca it cannot go away. Grassland is much important to the environment as anything else. You know, there's been more oil production, a little more traffic that goes along with it. On a scale of one to 10, you're changing my life. You're gonna be in the very, very low numbers. I've actually kind of enjoyed it out here with all the oil stuff going on, because it's a whole new experience for me. 
What I would like people to know is that we target all of our development with an eye toward low impact. We want to minimize our footprint on the surface. We want to utilize infrastructure and technology where possible to leave the landscape as least disturbed as possible and be as responsible a neighbor and an operator as we can. I think a lot of people don't understand where energy comes from and oil is a part of that energy that is fueling the way we all live our lives from where how you turn on your light switch in the morning and there's electricity there to getting in your car to even so many of the devices we use, cell phones, bicycles, everything comes from petroleum in one sense or another. For instance, to raise a wheat crop, you plant the seed, you use diesel fuel to plant, put that seed in the ground, you use fuel to harvest it, you use fuel to haul it to market to the elevator, and then they have to get it to the flour mill, so they use energy. It takes energy to grind it into flour. It's very interrelated. People I've worked with in oil and gas have great reverence for the outdoors, and we want to make as minimal an impact as possible while still extracting the oil and energy that's so necessary for modern life. We view coming out to an area like the grasslands and operating as a responsibility. We have employees who are from here. Our founder actually is just from a couple miles down the road even. This is an area that we consider our home. It's important to us to take care of it and make sure that the animals that are here, the water that was here when we came, the air that everyone is breathing is all remaining intact and stays that way even long after we're gone. How about uh, coming here to just uh, get away and relax or something like that and just kind of appreciate the beauty of this area? You could do that too, right? You bet. Right. Uh, as you can see, there's an awful lot that you could explore out here. And we have a lot of recreation on our grasslands. There's hiking, there's biking, there's camping, and there's all sorts of stuff. And here in the Pawnee in particular, this area has been identified by the Audubon Society as an important bird, bird and biodiversity area. So this area is globally important for bird conservation. And another thing, uh, in fact, as I've been out here, I, think, I see a lot of people bring their cameras out here, right? You bet. Photography's big. So photography is a really popular activity. I know I love to come up here to take pictures, and you see the vast landscapes. We've got all the wildlife, these dramatic skies. There's just an awful lot of things that folks come out here for photography purpose. And uh, likewise, we've got windmills and these trees that we call lone, lone trees, just individual trees on a prairie horizon. And so there's a lot going on for photographers. Yeah, I've seen well. that. Photographers just take a picture of yep. one lone tree yep. wherever they go, They're right? Kind of yeah. icons of the plains, that's if you will. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. And that's not all. One fascinating resource that can be found on many grasslands, including the Pawnee, are fossils. Did you know that many states have a state fossil? And the state fossil of Colorado is the Stegosaurus. Uh, so we want to find out what fossils we could find in our grasslands, and you brought us a few examples, haven't you? Sure, we'll, we'll talk about the examples that we brought, but mm -hmm. before that, I just want to tell you a little bit about some of the interpretive sites that we yeah. have for fossil resources in our national grasslands. We do have fossils in a lot of our grasslands, and there are three sites in particular I'd like to mention. One is the Toadstool Geologic Park in northwestern Nebraska, okay. the uh, Picket Wire Canyon down on the Comanche National, national Grassland in southeastern Colorado, and the Bull Canyon site out in Utah. And the Toadstool Geologic area is a really fascinating place. They've got ancient mammals that are there where you can see tracks in the, in the rock. Mm -hmm. And they've got critters such as entelodonts, which are ancient pigs. Entelodonts. Entelodonts. Can you guys, can you guys all say that? <laughs> entelodonts, everybody. Okay. And in addition to that, we have a, a critter up there that's similar to a hyena called a hyenodon. So we've got all kinds of crazy animals up there that have been uncovered as fossils up at Toadstool. Okay. But probably my favorite is the Picket Wire Canyon. This is an area down in southeastern Colorado where there used to be this ancient lake bed and we had a lot of big dinosaurs down there. There's mm -hmm. a trail that takes you from the trailhead up through some important cultural sites out to what we call the, the racetrack, the raceway. And out here we have a lot of these sauropods, these really huge dinosaurs with long necks that would be plant eaters and they would leave tracks in the rock, in the mud there, which over time formed into the limestone as prints that have been fossilized. So we've got over 1,600 individual tracks up there, including some tracks in parallel. What do you think those are? So in parallel, so families? So no? it could be families. That's that's one of the families? guesses, yeah. and they definitely think it's. Or they were now. actually racing. Yeah, know, that well, might we, we call it a race track. <laughs> but they, they, what triggered to believe it is family groups is that you have tracks of different sizes. So you've got 
apparently family groups traveling together along this this what's now a riverbed. So it's really fascinating stuff down there. Wow, that's amazing. Now uh, we actually have some hands-on stuff here. I wish I wish we could invite everybody just to come in and touch this, but we'll try to show them what you what you got here. Sure. So right here we have four replicas, and I'll show them to you kind of in. in order of size okay and these are all from an allosaurus which was a theropod and they were the two-legged the dinosaurs that stood on two legs and had short forearms and were meat eaters okay so what we'll we have here right. is a tooth from oh that's a tooth that's a tooth so we'll, we'll kind of dress up here and then we have a claw so now we're kind of being a dinosaur and then in addition to these two little guys we've got a hip bone Hip bone. Yep. So you can imagine, wow. you know, that being about what this is on us. Okay. And that was connected to the knee bone, right? Oh, you're gonna do that. Is that to how me? it goes? Oh. Okay. Hip bone connected to the knee bone. Yeah. And the knee bone's connected to the ankle bone. Shin bone. Right? Okay. Uh, oh, shin bone. Uh, I forgot right, about right, the shin right. bone. Okay. And then the last one we have is an actual vertebra from the backbone. So this would be sitting like this, oh, how stacked cool is up that? through the spine of the dinosaur. So you'd have a whole bunch of these as the spine of the dinosaur. Yeah, wow. exactly. So that these are four for all from Allosaurus, which did occur in Colorado. Okay. And I've been told that Allosaurus actually would battle sometimes with Stegosaurus. So here we've got oh. a replica of what battled with our state dinosaur. Go beautiful, ahead. beautiful. And I know we have a big kahuna over here. We do. I wonder if we should, shall we pick this baby up and bring it over? Or you guys want to go with us and follow us over here? Okay, let's. This is the Fred Flintstone uh, bone, right? So this right here, if you can believe it, is the thigh bone. Is a femur of a of a diplocus. Dip, 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 diplococcus. We'll go with that. Anybody? <laughs> Diplodocus. Diplodocus. Dip, there Diplodocus. There it is. Diplodocus. That's the one that was so hard. Okay. So here's a femur of another one of these big sauropods, like Brontosaurus and those, and this is from Diplodocus. And you can imagine if this femur is almost as tall as I am, how big this dinosaur must have been. Oh my so, God. And this is this is a, a actual replica weight and everything, right? No. Or no, it was probably a little probably heavier. Probably a little heavier. Okay. All but right. size-wise, it's an exact replica. Good deal, so. Rick. Thank you so much. You're welcome. What an interesting time here. And now, if you would like to visit uh, places uh, that Rick talked about, maybe uh, go see the fossils, go see the trackways out there, check out the Grasslands website for more information. And uh, I, I want you to uh, check that out if you can. Um, and come visit these places, really. It's really important that you come out and check it out. And above all, when you do come out, make sure you can serve and protect all the fossils that you see and everything else as well for future generations so they could come out and enjoy them as well. So, so far we've been talking about uh, grasslands uh, that have uh, historically been important to people and uh, animals and all kinds of things here. Uh, let's talk a little bit about how these grasslands are so important to wildlife. So starting uh, with birds here, I'd like to, to introduce you to Aaron. Aaron Youngberg with the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. Aaron, thank you for joining us. Yeah, All good right. to be here. Good to have you here. Let's start out with why the grasslands are so important to the birds. Well, there's three really important things about birds and grasslands. Uh, the birds are actually essential for the grassland ecosystem to function. They help disperse seeds. They fertilize the soil with their droppings. They help to control insects and rodents. And they also serve as food items for other animals. And grasslands also provide a stopover habitat for birds migrating through, including shorebirds and other waterfowl that might actually stop and nest in the prairie wetlands. Birds, these birds have a long way to fly, too. They right? do, yeah. thousands of miles, some yeah. of them are coming. Um, so they really need these places to stop and rest and they refuel. Um, and thirdly, and possibly the most important, there are 29 species of birds that can only breed in the grasslands. Ah. And such a small group can easily be overlooked, especially compared to some of our more colorful or vocal species that we see in the forests. Um, and as a result, the population declines of grassland birds has gone largely unnoticed until recently. And now grassland birds are actually a conservation priority because a lot of the species have lost up to 70% of their population. 70%? Yeah, That's since, huge. since the 1960s. Wow. Yeah, so um, it's really important that we work together to conserve healthy grasslands because these birds can't adapt to any other habitat. So what is the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies doing to help these grassland birds right now? Well, Bird Conservancy works to conserve habitat by working with lander, landowners, ranchers, farmers, and uh, public entities like the Forest Service. Mm -hmm. We also do a lot of public outreach with our citizen science projects like the students are doing today. And we work with children uh, both inside and outside the classroom. We also do a lot of research to learn about birds and what ah, they need. Let's talk about the research. What, yeah. what are you guys uh, researching? 
Uh, well, we do a lot of research. Uh, birds migrate, so we do a lot of research both where they breed in the summer and where they spend the winter time. And uh, more than any other animal, birds tell us the connectivity of the grasslands because birds use grasslands both in Mexico, in the U.S., and in Canada. They don't recognize our national borders. So they're not flying around with maps, <laughs> seeing where they're supposed to go or their GPS, right? No, no, yeah. it's, it's really amazing. Um, uh -huh. And as you can see on the map, it shows where the grasslands once stretched from Canada across the Great Plains and down into Mexico and from the Rocky Mountains as far east as Ohio. Wow. But with a lot of habitat loss, we've also had a great loss in the number of birds, like I mentioned earlier. So we're working with the Audubon Society, the U.S. Forest Service, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, partners in the U.S. and Mexico, to do an integrated demographic study on two particular species that have so shown steep declines, the bear's sparrow and the grasshopper sparrow. Um, and an, integra and an integrated that demographic yeah, right? study <laughs> just means that we're doing uh, research both where they spend the summer and where they spend the winter. All right. Let's uh, take a look at just how this research is being done in the summer in Montana and in North Dakota. So I'm here in the Chihuahuan Desert uh, of northern Mexico. These are the wintering grounds where virtually all the grassland birds from the Great Plains come to spend the winter months. And in fact, it's a little longer than the winter. They're here for about eight months out of the year, starting in August, September, and all the way through April. So these grasslands that you see around me is where these birds come and live for the rest of the time when they're not in the Great Plains. Uh, a lot happens here that affects their survival. The birds have to avoid being eaten by predators. They have to be able to find enough food. Uh, and the grass that you see around me, these are the grass seeds that provide the food for them to, to survive the winter. And the number of birds that survive the winter down here affects the population size of the birds in Colorado and, and places on the breeding grounds. Uh, so this is a, a critically important habitat for the migratory birds of the Great Plains. So that's what uh, is going on and that's what they're doing to understand the life cycle of the birds in the summer. But let's talk about our other big season, the winter. Yeah, so scientists uh, have spent a lot of time in research on the areas where they breed in the U.S. and Canada, mm -hmm. but the populations still continue to decline and no large effort has ever been made to study the, the birds where they winter on their non-breeding grounds, uh -huh. which is the Chihuahuan Desert in uh -huh. northern Mexico. So we're in the middle of a multi-year study in a conservation area in northern Mexico in Hanos, Chihuahua. Hanos. So, so what have you discovered with the birds in Mexico? Well, um, unlike on their breeding grounds, the winter populations are much more mobile which mm -hmm. leaves them really vulnerable to predators and to weather events. Uh, we also learned that the rain in the previous summer is really important for the grass seed production that the birds need to survive huh? for food and cover through the winter. And really important also is the management of the grasslands down there um, to keep invasive plants and shrubs to a minimum and to not overgraze so the birds can have healthy grass to survive. Through so the we talked a little bit about birds migrating, but these little birds <laughs> can travel over, over 2,000 miles migrating from Mexico to Colorado and beyond, all the way to North Dakota, Montana, and even to Canada, right? That's right. They, get, they gotta be strong, right? Yes, they yeah. do. <laughs> oh, for sure. That's amazing. Considering this long journey, we need to do our part in helping them on that journey. Aaron, thank you so much for joining thank us you. this morning. It's good to have you here. Let's check in now and get some questions from our viewers in school. Let's head over to our expert desk. And Mike, we told you we would come to you next. Uh, do you have a good question for us? Yeah, we had a great question about how is the plateau, how has the Pawnee Buttes changed over the last six, six years? And the biggest change has been in the energy development area with the wind farm you can see in the background and oil wells being drilled to access the oil under the plateau. Beautiful. Kristen, how about you? You got one for us? Uh, yeah, I have a question from Ezra in Bear Creek, Boulder. Colorado and she asked why are there not very many trees? And the reason is is there's not much much precipitation on the grassland. Trees need more water than the grassland can provide. Um, the early homesteaders planted some trees and they were there to keep wa keep the water going for the trees so you do find a few scattered ones and then the cottonwood trees are sometimes found along the creeks. Like Rick talked about lone trees. We have a lot of yes. lone trees out here, right? Yep. This is such a great opportunity. Thank you experts for that. Uh, you can learn about the grassland, so please keep your questions coming.
Ecology is the study of interactions among organisms and their environment. It includes the full range of life from tiny, tiny bacteria to processes that span the entire planet. So now let's talk about other species that we find on the grasslands. And joining me is Lynn Dybell with the Wildlife Program uh, Management uh, Department for the Arapaho and Roosevelt National Forest and the Pawnee National Grassland as well. Lynn, thank you for joining Hi, us. Dave. Good to see you. Good to see you this morning. So what other birds might people see here at the grasslands? Well, in addition to the birds we've already talked about, um, we can find magnificent raptors out on the grasslands, including right here on our own Pawnee Buttes. So you can mm -hmm. find golden eagles, ferruginous hawk, and Swainson's hawk. And if it's songbirds you're into, we have some beautiful meadow larks. We can hear them now. Yep, we can hear bit. the meadow larks, <laughs> um, loggerhead shrike, as well as lark bunting. So how about animals? You know, we, we were talking a lot about birds, but there's a ton of animals out there. There are. Too, right? You can find the full suite of mammals, reptiles, amphibian, and fish. So, for example, um, as you're driving along on your way into the grasslands, you're likely to see um, pronghorn alongside of the road. And they are one of the fastest animals on Earth, uh, reaching speeds of up to 70 miles per hour. And wow. um, that's pretty fast. That's so if you're driving good. along and you happen to see one, take a quick glance at your speedometer and see how fast they're going. You might get a ticket if you're yeah. keeping up with the pronghorns, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And a um, uh, less common uh, animal that you might see would be the swift fox. They're nocturnal, so they're mostly out in the evenings. But um, badger are also another common oh, really? mammal that. that you would find on the grasslands. Okay. I know there's one mammal in particular that is especially associated with the grasslands. Yes, Dave. That would be the prairie dog. Uh, prairie dogs are considered a keystone species because they are key to the functionality of a healthy grassland system. There's thought to be over 150 different species that are dependent on prairie dogs for food, shelter, and habitat creation. Now tell us a little bit about the relationship of the prairie dog and another animal that's real big out here too, I know the black-footed ferret. I didn't even know those were out here. Well, we don't have black-footed ferrets on the oh, Pawnee okay, National okay. Grassland, but we do have them in, on grasslands in North America. And that's a really interesting story because up until 1981, the black-footed ferret was thought to be extinct, and they found a population of them in uh, Wyoming, just north of here. And when those uh, few ferrets were discovered, scientists took them into captivity and started a breeding program. And since that time, they have reintroduced ferrets at 24 different locations across North America. Wow. And the way that prairie dogs are key to the success of the black-footed ferret which is one of the most endangered species on the planet, um, is that prairie dogs make up 90% of a black-footed ferret's diet. So that's a lot of oh my gosh. prairie dogs for a black-footed ferret to eat. <laughs> um, the other way that they contribute to the success of black-footed ferret is they use the prairie dog's very complex system of burrows that are underground, and that's where black-footed ferrets raise their young and protect themselves from predators as well as the elements. I think that's especially important for those of us who live in the city. We kind of look at prairie dogs as a nuisance, but they're really a key to the whole ecology coming together, right? They are. They're very important for the, the functionality. Like I said, uh, up, up to 150 different species relying on them Beautiful. for food, shelter, or habitat creation. Awesome, Lynn. Thank you so much for sharing welcome, that Dave. info with us. Uh, just about how the ecology works and that type of thing. Um, we have a couple more questions. The questions are coming in fast and furious. so. I'm going to go over to the experts here, and Angela, I think it's your turn to give us a, a good one. You got one for us? I sure do. From, uh, let's see, from Jeremy. So he asks um, why it's important to conserve grasslands. So apart from the fact that they're home to only a few animals and plants that wouldn't exist anywhere else, and there's mm -hmm. such a massive amount of biodiversity out here, um, there's actually some evidence that they store a lot of carbon um, possibly reducing greenhouse gases. So they almost as much as forest systems can, so they can help really keep our earth healthy. Great, thanks Angela. Mike, uh, anything good down on that end? Yeah, we had a great question on okay. the impact of energy development on the grasslands. And energy companies utilize technology like horizontal drilling and locating facilities away from sensitive areas to try and minimize the impact on the grasslands and the wildlife here. Okay, Kristen, how about you? I have a question of what are your favorite grassland species? And I would say the prairie dog, because like Lynn mentioned, they're just so important to the grassland to provide food and habitat. 
I also really like the swift fox because they're a unique animal that only lives on the grassland and you can find them at night and they live in burrows. Good job, good job. Angela, we have time for one more if you have one there. Um, sure, sure. Um, I've got what types of animals live in grass and biomes. I think we've talked a lot about this, but um, really it's just about everything. Mammals, reptiles, birds, um, amphibians, fish even. And um, so they're really important and highly under, under misunderstood and underappreciated ecosystems. Beautiful. Just no African elephants or giraffes are out here though, right? Not in North American <laughs> uh, grasslands, oh. but um, certainly they're... You know, on um, other continents, yeah, right? In yeah. the grasslands, that's where they live, right? Okay. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I was just joking. Sorry to throw you a curve there. I'll uh, appreciate it. We'll, <laughs> we'll have another opportunity to answer some of your questions at the end of the program. So please keep sending them in to the email address you see at the bottom of your screen. Sorry. We've learned so much about the importance of these grasslands to people and wildlife and we've also talked a little bit about how much of these grasslands have been lost over time. Rick Truax with the Forest Service joins us again. Rick, good to see you here. Glad you're sticking around with us here. Um, there's a lot of challenges out here that this ecosystem is facing, isn't there? Yeah, I want to tell you about a few of the challenges that we see out here and we all have a kind of a collective responsibility to think about. First, I want to talk a bit about habitat fragmentation. Okay. And habitat fragmentation is a process where you take a large block of habitat and then you make it into smaller and smaller blocks and all of a sudden the smaller blocks become isolated from one another. And that can happen through road development, through urban sprawl, even fences can, habitat frag can fragment habitat for certain species. But what we do know is there are some management tools that can help us kind of mitigate and plan for fragmentation and kind of take care of it as best we can through corridors and, and you know, common uses of lands and management of lands across boundaries, that kind of thing. So planning is the key here. Planning is the key, yeah. Planning and, and the bringing science into how we do the planning is really important when it comes to habitat fragmentation. Good deal. Thank you, Rick. That's quite a list of challenges. Yeah. Any more? Because we, yeah. I know we talked about uh, drought, we talked about fire, we talked about all kinds of things sure, like so that earlier. We, right? You mentioned conversion of grasslands earlier, and it still is a problem. It's not as big a problem now as it was maybe 20 years ago, but there still are native grasslands that are being converted to agriculture. And so that's a really problematic loss of, of grassland habitat, essentially. And, and then uh, this idea of drought is, you know, we talked about these systems kind of evolving with drought, but at the same time, when you get extreme droughts, that can be problematic. And that can have real stresses on the environment, both in the plants and the animals, and for the services that the ecosystem provides to us. So as we see perhaps more extreme droughts, longer droughts or, or deeper droughts, we may see more problems with drought in these grasslands. And then one more that I think interacts with drought quite a bit is invasive species. And we think of invasives usually as plant species, and that's often where the problems are. Invasive species are not native to an area, and what happens once they become established, they can spread very quickly and almost take over an area. And when that happens, you lose the, the habitat quality that the native grasses provide for, through food, shelter, etc. So we do have a problem with invasives and coordinating with a lot of partners to work on that problem. Another uh, thing that we are concerned with, with, with wildfire, now, you know, it's, it's a big concern in the forests of Colorado, yes. but it's also a concern uh, out here on the grasslands too, isn't it? It is, and you know, fire occurred historically here through lightning strikes as well as through Native American use of fire to manage the landscape. But over the last century, we've been a little bit averse to using fire as a management tool. We're starting to use it more and more and as a really important tool in the toolbox to use carefully planned and implemented prescribed fires to help the grasslands. And what fire on these landscapes does is several things. It basically releases and recycles nutrients. So all the nutrients that are stuck in dead materials, they'll get recycled back into the system and it can prepare the seedbed for germination. Uh -huh. So some species will actually only germinate after a fire. So there are a variety of reasons that fire is really important to these grasslands and the Forest Service and a lot of our partners are working to bring fire back to these landscapes as best we can in a responsible way, knowing there's a lot of sensitivity with all the human infrastructure, communities, that's always on our mind. 
Beautiful, good information there. It's so important to know about these challenges and threats so that we can make informed choices, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yeah, good deal. Thank you, Rick, so much. I understand now that the students are ready to report out on their activities. Allison Fowl joins us again with the uh, Bird Conservancy of the Rockies and our students here from Dos Rios Elementary. Let's uh, figure out what you guys found out. Yeah, so we had a great time using our binoculars and our ears to look for birds that are far away and to listen for birds that are well hidden or moving fast. Sometimes listening for birds is a much easier way to find them. Since we know which birds are most common out here on the grasslands, we could narrow it down to just a few possibilities. Whenever we saw a bird, we'd look for distinctive markings on it and then we'd use our field guides to confirm which species of bird that we saw. Later, one of our citizen scientists will take our recorded species and enter it on eBird. Armando, can you tell us about one of the birds that we saw today? We've seen, I, we've seen brought, um, grasshopper sparrows. I can tell that it was grasshopper sparrows because it had an, we, I, it had an eyebrow. Field guides point out the identifying features of, of a species. Here's an example from the field guide of a grasshopper sparrow. Great, thanks, Armando. And Josiah, can you tell us a little bit about eBird? eBird is really is really cool because you can go to the web to the website eBird.org. You click on submit observations and you put in the location from where you made your observations. Um, Great, and we'll be doing that as soon as we're done with Grasslands Live this morning. Thank you, guys. Good deal. Good deal. So, um, had, did you guys have fun out there? Just check real quick. Well, we got a few smiles there. Um, I understand that the uh, Forest Service uh, uses this data to help see what species we are using uh, and what species uh, are out here on the grasslands using the grasslands and forests. So thank uh, the students one more time from Dos Rios uh, Elementary for coming out today. Thank you guys very much. So uh, as we move ahead, let's answer some more questions, shall we? Our experts, you guys have more questions, don't you? Oh yeah, we're yeah, you do. Questions. Okay, let's yeah. uh, let's come over here. Let's see. Um, um, how about uh, Mike? Why don't we start with you? You got one down there for us? Sure. Yeah, we okay. had a question from Mika on how did the oil get down there in the first place? Okay. And millions of years ago, this was a big interior seaway, and the organic matter in the ocean dropped to the bottom and became over time the oil that we're extracting today. Beautiful, beautiful. Kristen, how about you? Um, we have one question about. How many types of animals are in the Pawnee National Grasslands? Um, there are, as we talked about, there are many different kinds of birds. We have over 20 different species of birds that need the grasslands to survive. We also have ferruginous hawks, we have badgers, coyotes, um, lots of different animals that, that are out here, so you should come and visit them. Wow, that's a, a lot that I've never even, <laughs> never even had any idea they were out here. Angela, I know you have some good questions for us. Sure. Kylie from Bear Creek Elementary in Boulder asks, why do grasslands still exist when they burn up, so after a wildfire? A wildfire? Oh. Um, well, basically, they still exist because the roots don't die. So they're able to basically regrow within just a few months of a fire. And it actually gets rid of a lot of the dead, um, older grass and sort of freshens up the system and it's healthier after a fire. I thought that was interesting what Rick said about how the fire could actually be good for the mm -hmm. grasslands, right? Certainly. So even, even though for most of us we don't want to see fire, sometimes it's a good thing. Brings, Definitely can brings, be. Brings mm -hmm. things back. Mike, do you have a, another one for us? Uh, yeah, and there's a question on does the oil in the ground hurt the animals in the, oh, in the Pawnee Buttes? That's a good one. That's right, and the oil is, is several thousand feet or up to a mile below the surface. And so when companies drill for oil, they utilize the best practices and a lot of technology to make sure that it doesn't impact the local wildlife or the uh, grasslands out here. Okay. I, I know we have a lot of kids online in other areas, so we're going to keep going with some of the questions that are coming in so we can include as many people as we can in the, uh, in the program here. So Kristen, why don't we hit them with another question here? Um, another question from Charlotte in Boulder is, are there snakes? And yes, there are snakes on the grassland. We have uh, bull snakes and rattlesnakes. So you um, need to watch your step when you're out there, but, but uh, yeah, they're out there eating other animals and keeping the ecosystem healthy. Have we seen any out here today? Uh, no. 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 Oh, thank goodness. Yeah. Thank goodness. Angela, uh, how about you? Let's throw another question up on there. Sure. I've got one about what are um, some of the most uh, dangerous animals. Oh, on grassland. So funny. from my perspective, I guess it depends on what you are. If you're a mouse, then a burrowing owl <laughs> would probably be pretty dangerous to you. And uh -huh. if you're 
um, if you're an antelope, then an, a lion or um, something a little bit with, with some teeth would be a little bit more dangerous. Out here, for in terms of people, I think you're pretty safe. Um, again, as long as you just let snakes be. The rattlesnake out mm -hmm. here is probably the, the bad guy. For us, anyway, right? <laughs> Good for the system, now. Mike, how about you? Yeah, we had a question on how are these buttes that you see behind us formed? And that was caused by erosion over millions of years as wind and water carved away the rock and left behind these beautiful buttes that we see behind us. Good one, good one. Kristen, let's hit them with another one. We're just going to go through uh, and just see, see as many as we can here. Okay. Before we, we're almost out of time, but we want to get as many questions answered as we can because we got everybody online here. Okay. So James asked, why are grasslands important? Well, they provide a unique habitat for grassland birds and species. Many of these species don't live anywhere else. And they provide stepover points for birds. And they're also a source of oil for us to use. They provide places for bird watching and camping. And um, they provide carbon and water. All right, Angela, how about you? Sure, I've got one about um, our grasslands place where people could live. Well, certainly they did and they still do. Um, and it's actually quite beneficial because we've talked about how ranching families and communities help um, keep the, the nutrients going and, and cycling through and are actually really good for, for the grasslands. And the Pawnees is uh, a real important part of Colorado that a lot of people don't know about. Um, you could camp up here, you could hike up here and do all that type of thing, right? Yeah, definitely um, a hidden treasure. It's a hidden treasure. And if, you, if you're one of those that likes to hike, um, alone with not big crowds around and that type of thing, this is a good place to come, right? That's right. Right. Okay, Mike, do you have another one for us? Yeah, we had a question about, you know, what can we do to help protect the grasslands? And programs like this are a great way to do it, learn more about the grasslands and educate it, and just spread the word on, on what kind of, you know, ecosystem this is and how important it is. Mm -hmm. And you're with Whiting Petroleum, and Whiting Petroleum uh, kind of works uh, in tandem with Forest Service and everything out here. Can you speak to that a little bit? That's right, yes. We work very closely with the Forest Service and wildlife biologists like the Bird Conservancy to really have uh, you know, multiple use out here and be responsible operators uh, you know, in this area. Excellent. Kristen, what do you think? You got another one? Uh, let's see. I had one. I get a lot of questions about how many endangered species are on the grassland. And it depends on what grassland you're at and what list you're looking at, whether it's a state list or a federal list. But I would say the most uh, well-known uh, endangered animal um, on grasslands, it's no longer on the Pawnee, but is the black-footed ferret, which we, lives in prairie dog towns. Okay. Angela, how about you? Sure. Um, Paul from Aurora, Colorado asks, well, how's the weather over there? And it's, <laughs> I could it's probably a, do that one. <laughs> it's a great Go question, <laughs> um, just because being prepared is very important when you come out here. But um, I responded with, it's nice and warm today. But really, it's very unpredictable. It can be very cold, very hot all in the same day, um, likely with the potential of a hailstorm moving through. It could snow tomorrow. Uh, actually, I think it is going to snow on Friday. It is. It um, is. Thursday night into Friday. So being very yeah. prepared, it really can be unpredictable, which was a detriment to early settlers, I think. We were a little worried uh, last night. We were watching thunderstorms roaming all around here. We got some great winds here, and then last night it rained out here. So we had a plan earlier. Uh, uh, I'm glad the sun came out and, sh and shined today because our plan was to go under this little teeny tiny picnic uh, awning that's over there. So we really lucked out uh, with our plan today. But yeah, especially this time of year, you could get se severe thunderstorms coming through here. Uh, you know, uh, occasionally tornadoes can pop up and that type of thing. Uh, so you just got to be prepared for prepared for the weather. You don't have any trees to protect you from wind or, or anything like that as well. I think we have time for one more question. Mike, what do you think? Yeah, sure. And we had one that ties into that of what's the main water source out here. Oh. And that's, you know, the the snow melt from the winter snowpack out here and then the seasonal spring rains and then during most of the summer this is a really dry area so uh -huh. a lot of seasonal moisture early on in the year and then not much later on in the year and sure. there's a, there's some fishing out in the grasslands in certain areas there too, is, right? isn't a, there? there's a few reservoirs and lakes out yeah. here okay. not very much this is a pretty dry area but so fishermen are welcome absolutely are welcome that type of thing even if you're hiking well thank you all uh, we're almost out of time here so we want to wrap up thank you for all those great questions uh, they were just incredible. We uh, have been learning what a special place these grasslands are and about the threats that they face. Before we end our program, I'd like to ask each one of our experts to summarize what they would have us all do to help conserve these beautiful national treasures. 
Grasslands are full of life. Next time you're out in our grasslands, think of what they mean to you and why they're important. Look for burrowing owls in prairie dog towns and ducks in our wetlands. Spread the word about the importance of grasslands. And remember, grasslands are important not just for birds and wildlife, but also for people too. It's in our best interest to be good stewards of these resources. It's important to respect and honor all cultures that are indigenous to the grasslands of the United States. It's important to keep native grasslands intact. There's great value in managing the land so that it's not fragmented. The ecosystem services are greater in larger parcels. And grasslands have many benefits as recreation spaces, as wildlife habitat. They also store lots of carbon in the soil. Uh, it makes the land more valuable as natural spaces to us and to wildlife rather than turn into cities or other developments. Hi, our national forests and grasslands belong to all of us, and we invite you to get out and enjoy them. But we ask that you please do so responsibly. That means staying on the trails, don't litter, and enjoy wildlife from a safe distance. Also, our national parks and waterways are out there waiting for you to discover them. And if you're a fourth grader, you can get a free pass to enjoy these lands. Just go to everykidinapark.gov and you'll get a free pass for you and your family. So get out there, America. It's all yours. All right, I want to thank you all so much for your thoughts, and that's all the time we have for today. I want to thank the students of Dos Rios Elementary. Thank you. And our experts today. And our experts today. Okay, they're, they're thanking us as well. Um, so I just want to thank you for joining us here at the Pawnee National Grasslands. Big thank you to all of those who watched our webcast, and thank you for sending us your questions and comments and all that type of thing. I hope this isn't the end of your grasslands exploration, though. We talked about the ways you can get involved in the outdoors and have fun and learn and help conserve and all that thing in very special places like this. You can also learn more about the grasslands by going to the website. There is an evaluation form on the program there, so please let us know what you think. And remember, grasslands are a unique and amazing place to visit. The more you know, the more you'll value this extraordinary habitat and landscape. Thanks to all of you for joining us today, and thanks to all of our partners and sponsors for making this Grasslands Live field trip possible. Have a great day. CBS4 takes a virtual field trip on Grasslands Live. Thanks to our sponsors, including our presenting sponsor, Whiting Petroleum, committed to creating strong communities and a clean environment.